Hey friend, and welcome to the Camera Brave Show. My name's Marissa, and I help people fearlessly create content and find their own beautiful voice. In this show, we talk all about strategy, mindset, and confidence, not to mention the power of storytelling through my personal favorite thing, video. Thank you so much for joining me. Let's dive right in. Hello, friend, and welcome back to another episode of the Camera Brave Show. My name's Marissa, your video marketing coach, teaching you how to take stunning videos and feel confident on camera. Today, I'm going to do something I've never done before, and I'm just going to take this time to share with you my story. This is the story of how I got here as a video marketing coach, how I started Camera Brave, and probably more importantly, and the thing that you may actually want to hear is my background with video and my journey to building my own confidence on camera. When I just thought of this idea about 10 minutes ago to share my own story with you as I'm going through my list of content ideas, thinking about all of the different topics that have come into my DMs recently and what I should touch on. It actually blew my mind that I have not done just a straight episode of my story. So I think in my mind, I assumed that I've told my story in bits and pieces, in captions on my photos. I've done a couple of interviews this year where I've given my story. I've talked about it inside of my coaching programs or maybe some of my lives here and there, but I have never just in one place sat here and talked about myself. And what's interesting is that I think my reservation on that was, well, do people really want to know my story? But that's not the right question to be asking myself. The right question is, why am I not telling my story? Why am I waiting and telling my own personal story? Because if you're listening to the show, I'm going to argue that you are or have a desire or some sort of passion for storytelling. Even if you haven't claimed that word for yourself yet, if you are listening in here, then there is something that compels you about the idea of video, about the idea of connecting digitally with other people. And the thing that allows us to really make these deep connections with each other is the story, the power of my story. I can talk to you about video tips and techniques and how to frame your videos, light them, have perfect audio. I can teach you all of those things, but the real reason that you're here on my page or listening to my content is because you have some sort of connection with me. And it could be as basic as you enjoy my pacing or my inflection or or something like that, but there's some sort of connection that we build. And I think that comes across a little bit differently via podcast versus outwardly on like a social media channel. Does that make sense? Like, I think that we're building deeper connections and we're more storyline driven in these podcast episodes where it's just me and the microphone and you listening in your car, on your way to the grocery store, wherever you are currently. So, so that's what we're going to talk about. This episode is entirely talking about my story. I don't have a script. I don't have a content outline. I'm going rogue and I'm going to attempt to edit this as minimally as possible. That way it just feels like an open and honest conversation. So here we go. My story. I'm going to specifically take this from the angle of my journey on camera, because I do think that's, what's going to be impactful to you and my journey as an entrepreneur as well. So I'm going to skip a lot of the, uh, medium in between details here and start with the first on-camera job that I landed. So that was when I was in high school. I was 16 years old. So please let that sink in. If you watch my content and you think she's a natural, she's just so good. It's just effortless for her. Please understand that I had my first paid job practicing on camera at 16 years old. And I was trained underneath some very critically acclaimed and impressive storytelling journalists at that job. So this job was at the school board locally where I'm at here in Florida. And 
It was essentially for a program that they had where they highlighted different high schools and different programs in the area, and they wanted a high school senior to be the MC of the show. So I went on to MC that show. It is hilarious to me to look back at that footage because I did recently find some of the first videos of me on camera, and it is hilarious. So that was my very first gig at 16 years old doing hosting a show that actually did air on local TV. So that was kind of fun. I never actually saw myself on TV, but I was told by some loved ones that they would catch me, you know, at very obscure middle of the day times um, on TV. So that was my very first job there. And I learned a lot. One of the journalists that I had learned from taught me how to print out the scripts. So this was a completely teleprompter based job. She taught me how to print out the scripts and mark them up. And we would mark them in a couple of different ways. So one way would be slashes for where we should pause for where natural pauses would best make sense inside of this story. Now, keep in mind, she was a journalist. So a journalist and a reporter is going to deliver and inflect a little bit differently versus is someone who's hosting a show or in like the entertainment industry. So they're not the same exact methods, but I do think that the way that I speak stems from the way that I was trained and this is how it all started. So we would mark these scripts with little slashes to really say where the pauses should be. And then we would also underline or emphasize certain words that really needed to be highlighted or emphasized. So that is what we would do with our scripts. And then all of this was teleprompter read. So I would essentially stand up there, smile big, stand up straight and read off of the teleprompter. Super exciting. That show went on to win a telly award, which is very exciting. And I'm very very proud that the first accomplishment that I had was, was recognized. I mean, it just feels good when you put something that's new to you when you're starting on this new journey and putting it out there into the world and then to receive recognition for it. It's an amazing, amazing feeling. So I very much had an amazing experience my first time on camera. Now I look back at it and I'm, it's so cringy to me to watch, but that's, where I started and I'm would not have had this growth if I had not started there. So I acknowledge the growth, I acknowledge the journey. And that is where it all began at age 16 and ended with a telly award. So at the same time, when I was still in high school, I had no athletic ability whatsoever, zero athletic ability. I was in zero sports and I found my calling. Um, in theater. So I really loved being on stage. I was involved in smaller productions, nothing big, uh, but a bunch of smaller little theater productions and loved being on stage, went on to be drama club president. So that was all my thing. And I think that that also has a huge influence on the way that I deliver on camera. So I learned through theater to be over energetic because it's easier to tone down energy where it can be more difficult to ramp up energy if you have flat energy. So a lot of my philosophies on energy stem from my background in theater. So that is what led to me as a very young professional getting the skills and the traits that I had for starting on camera. Fast forward to college where I decided to get my certificate in video production. So just based off the tiny little sliver of studio production and short videos that I'd had, I knew that I wanted to study production in some capacity, but I was not ready to commit to a full degree in it yet. So I went and got my AA at a local college and got my certificate in video production. And it was in that track when I fell in love with studio production. So that was where that whole passion journey really was fueled was at my first year of college in a studio production class. And I absolutely fell in love with that. And that is what led to me going to get my BA, my Bachelor of Arts at a university in broadcast production was just falling in love with the studio. All of this, all of this is linked, I promise. It's just to show you that I did not just show up here. I did not just one day like 
poof, decide that this was going to be my path and my career. This has been years in the making. It's a part of who I am and a part of the journey of my personal life absolutely links into how I've become a business professional. So keep that in mind in your own journey that it's all connected. Even these obscure things like the first paying job or not being good at sports. So I ended up just on the stage a lot. All of those things have brought me to where I am right now. So we're back in college first year, first two years. So much fun. I loved that college a lot. And learning how to get my video production certificate, taking some script writing classes, intro to studio production, and even, it's all like coming back to me now, uh, all of all of the things. So I was even in our, one of our like top classes. So the certificate was five classes and like the capstone last class that you had to take. We got to produce a, I don't wanna call it a documentary. We got to produce something. And it was really funny because the day that we pitched our ideas, so basically the whole class came up and everyone pitched an idea for the story that we were going to tell. I can't remember if it was supposed to be narrative or documentary style, but I'm pretty sure it was supposed to be based on like an actual event or something going on in the community. So I had zero idea. And what would happen? Everyone would present an idea and then we would get into groups based on like the top five ideas of the class. So I had zero idea what to talk about, what to present, what to do. I was, you know, it was a late night class. So I kind of just showed up with like a giant diet Coke and I was like, <laughs> I got nothing. So we all had to go up to the whiteboard, write down our idea. So I went up and I was very newly taking ASL American Sign Language classes because of my degree and wanting to go on to major. I knew that I wanted to major in mass communications. And to do that, you needed to have two years of a foreign language. And I am Cuban American and I have taken more Spanish classes than I will ever need to take. Um, in my life. And no, I'm not fluent. So I decided no way, not, not doing Spanish, not even going to try to learn French. So I decided to take American sign language. So I'm up at the front of the board and we had just learned about this concept called ASL poetry, which is a sign language version of storytelling. It's poetry in motion. So that was the idea that I pitched. I wrote it up on the whiteboard, talked about what I literally just learned in class that day. And out of all 20 ideas, that one got the most votes. So that was exciting. And obviously some interesting form of storytelling. So I ended up with a small group of four other students. And that was our topic. It was ASL poetry in motion is what we went on to call it. And that went on to air on a local station as well. So we knew that all of our pieces would have the opportunity to air on a local PBS station, the same one that I had aired that I had presented on when I was in high school. So that was very exciting. And I'm very proud of the uh, video that I made. I ended up using all of the connections that I had and we put together an ASL poetry event with three performers. One was a college age. One was uh, younger, like seven years old. And one was a teacher. All of them were deaf. All of them performed ASL poetry. It is something that I'm still very proud of and a project that I think was impactful in the community at the time. So that was my first real storytelling where I really felt like I brought someone's story outside of my circle, outside of my comfort zone to life. Looking for a deeper way to connect with your audience? One way I stepped into sharing my message was through creating a podcast. When I started this show, I had zero experience with podcast hosting. So one thing that really helped me get started was how easy it was to host my podcast through Buzzsprout. Buzzsprout makes it easy to manage your podcast and puts all the analytics right at your fingertips. Buzzsprout gets your show listed in every major podcast platform like Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Podcast, so you're able to reach your audience wherever they're listening. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout 
Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. Follow the link in the show notes to get started with Buzzsprout today. And make sure to use this link because you'll receive a $20 Amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid plan, which could literally go towards purchasing a microphone to record your show. Take the first step in creating your podcast by clicking the link below. So while I was in college, I was studying behind the camera, behind the scenes, and I also landed a job doing commercial work as a spokesperson. You may have heard me talk about this before. So essentially, I would go to a studio and I worked with a company that provided commercials for businesses and brands and all sorts of different things, really. And they would sell the videos. They would uh, write them, edit them film them, put the B-roll, the music, everything. And part of that component was having a spokesperson to read the script essentially. So that is the role that I took on. I started to do this work as a spokesperson. I really fell in love with it. I really enjoyed it. I would say that I developed a lot of my on-camera mannerisms from that job right there as a spokesperson. So it's interesting because that sort of work was again, teleprompter read. So it was all essentially reading, but a lot of the body language was brand new to me. So my posture is always straight, always shoulders back. And I think that muscle memory comes from having all of these scripts over years. I mean, I've been doing that job for eight or so years. So it's, I've done hundreds of these scripts. So you will never see me slouching on camera. And I think a part of that is because of the muscle memory that I've gained from there. I also do a lot of hand movements. I'm not insecure about it anymore because that's just the way that I talk and I've come to embrace it just as I hope that you embrace the things that other people may say are quirky or distracting or whatever the heck. I hope that you embrace them and just claim them as your own. Yes, I do talk with my hands. Thank you. <laughs> That's how I feel about that. So I do think that I developed a lot of my hand movements from that position, because when you were speaking on camera, if you just had your hands like in front of you, like, you know, one hand softly over the other in front of like your navel area, it would look so robotic. And we already had to stand very straight. If you're watching me on YouTube, you'll see we had to stand very straight with our elbows far out. That way there was a gap because they were all recorded on a green screen. And you had to make sure there was enough of a gap between your body and your arm. So that way the background could be shown everywhere, all throughout. So it's like wide armed, very straight up, uh, keeping your arms out, but then also doing these movements. Well, the hand movements had to be done at the elbow. That way you weren't messing up the background between yourself and your elbow. Anyway, a lot of, I, I created a lot of habits that I actually have learned to break when I'm not doing that specific job. But, uh, I mean, for years and years, that was all of the work that I did. So I definitely developed a good, way to do that, a pattern for it. And I do think that my, the one thing that that job really helped me and continues to help me, I still do it today to develop is my ability to add passion into any script or enthusiasm, animation, energy, whatever kind of word you want to use there. When you are reading anything off a teleprompter or anything that you have created or written in advance, you really have to go back in and add pieces of yourself into those written words. It's almost easier to just speak off the cuff and speak from the heart. But when something's already pre-written for you, you have to add these dynamic layers into it in real time as you're delivering it. So it's kind of like you're reading, you're thinking, and you're presenting all at the same time. So delivering live does have its challenges, but there are definite challenges in doing something that is pre-written or teleprompter read. And the absolute just most ironic part of this is that I was just speaking with a client inside of the Camera Brave Club today about teleprompter apps. So it's very interesting they each have their own level of difficulty, but one thing that I've developed in that, in my time there is the ability to add inflection and to be super aware of my pacing, my tone, my pitch. While I may not have been able to do a lot of fun things with my body movement because of the parameters of a green screen, I was able to do a lot of fun things with my voice. So it's allowed me 
to be able to fluctuate, to know what my own voice sounds like and to claim it a little bit more. I don't know that if I didn't have that job, if I would have been able to create the podcast as confidently as I had in the beginning. However, I knew that the voice that I had and the way that I spoke was intriguing to at least some business owners and some brand managers. I already had that starting base of, you know, we're not starting from absolute ground zero here. We are starting from somewhere. So that brings me to transferring to a university to finish out my bachelor of arts degree. So I was still continuing to do the spokesperson work and I had developed a fierce passion for storytelling. So I went on to major in mass communications with a focus in broadcast production. When I went on to the University of South Florida, I was really able to get my hands on more equipment. I was able to utilize their studios. Now, the school I went to before had a nice studio, but there was a much larger network at this university and a huge part of being involved in like the studio, the film, the videography industry is networking. So I was really able to build my network once I transferred here to the second college. So it was in... One of my favorite professor's classes that I had the opportunity to create a documentary. Now, I am nearly 100% positive he does not listen to this podcast, but uh, shout out to Professor Ryan Watson. It was in his class that I originally developed this amazing realization of telling other stories and seeing the impact that they had on the community. And I've been able to keep a relationship with him since, and we've worked on a lot of really creative projects since. So shout out to him. Now, when I did Poetry in Motion, that was an amazing, it was an event. It was a great way to connect and to see my content air on TV. That was very special. But in this instance, when we had to create a documentary, I got to see the effect that that work had on people, like actual people in the community. And that effect is what changed everything about storytelling for me and gave me a serious hunger to continue to chase storytelling. So tell me if this sounds familiar. It's the day where we're supposed to present the ideas for our documentaries. Um, and I've got nothing like I've got literally nothing. I have no ideas. I tried a couple of angles of stories that I thought would be interesting. And they were like instantly shot down by the professor. And so I was scrambling. So then I had a thought, my Nana is an entrepreneur. She is a first generation female business owner at the time when it was very difficult for women to get loans. It was a lot less common when she was at the height of her career. So I thought, Hey, that'd be kind of interesting. Maybe I could talk about that. So I call her and we start talking about the ideas for how we could possibly do this documentary. And at the time it was just her helping me because I needed help in class. I had no idea what to talk about and I was just really strapped for ideas. So she was going to help me out by letting me do a documentary on her entrepreneurial journey. Cut to our conversation. And I realized that there's a story buried deeper that is a lot more interesting, which is the fact that she was a first generation Cuban immigrant and brought her entire family from Cuba over to America. And her two cousins, both female, also brought their families over to America at the rise of Fidel Castro. So this story, just the favor she was going to help me do just became a full-fledged story. And I was like, wait a minute, we don't ever talk about this. And I think that's really common with a lot of like strong kind of survivors. They don't talk about their story. They don't share their hardships. Um, Maybe that's a generational thing. I don't know. But I was like, okay, wait a minute. This is an incredible story. This is empowering. Why are you guys not talking about this? Why do we not hear about this at Christmases? And why are we not just praising the fact that you guys made it here and that you paved the way for us? Like it was such a shocking, shocking moment for me. So 
went on to make a full-fledged documentary called Fleeing Fidel about my family's story on how the three separate households escaped from Cuba at the rise of Castro. Crazy stories. I mean, one of my great uncles was held as a political prisoner of war. Just this crazy story. And what really got to me is that nobody knew it. My cousin, no idea. The daughter of the man who was held a political war prisoner, he had passed several years ago. She had no idea. And what made this very relevant and interesting is that this was the year that Cuba opened up for tourism. So one of my family members actually had a trip planned to go visit Cuba and then watch the documentary and called her aunt sobbing one of the women who had uh who had come over and canceled her trip immediately because she thought there was just no way that she could go and visit after hearing the hardships that her family had faced from cuba so that became my proudest moment in being a storyteller was being able to tell that story and seeing the impact that it had on cuban americans cubans americans all sorts of immigrants that had found refuge in that particular story. So that changed a lot for me. And that made me hungry to have a platform where I can tell stories. And I have a million and one different ideas of how I plan to do that as a future storyteller, because I'm not done yet, still just getting started. So that is that. That leads me through college, my biggest storytelling missions, and how I presented myself on camera. And then, oh, one more, one more, and then then we'll get to post-college. Then after that whole storytelling, beautiful class, I had another studio production class where I landed an internship at HSN, AKA the Home Shopping Network. So I was a summer internship, super exciting. I was live in the studio, right where I wanted to be, where all the action was. I was a visual coordinator, which meant that I took care of the actual products that you see on TV. So if they're selling jewelry, if they're selling cosmetics, then we would take those products and shine them up, make them look all pretty. And we were responsible for actually getting them out onto the screens of your televisions. So that was HSN. I started there on call and I was continuing with them on and off, just on call when they needed me and then graduated college as an on-call there. I'm trying to just get my whole timeline right here, but yes, I graduated college and I did have various jobs, but they don't really align with this trajectory that I'm on right now. So I'm just going to skip them for time's sake because you don't need to know every single job I've ever had. Some of them were truly just placeholders. Fast forward a couple of years and I am out of college, struggling to adapt because no one really prepares you for when you're in school your entire life, just suddenly not being a student anymore. That was shocking. I had a very much a very difficult time kind of figuring out what I was supposed to do in this whole giant world once I was done with school. So I ended up full time at HSN, met amazing people, and at one point really loved the work I was doing there. Then the full time position came and I took it. I had been on call until then, which meant I could pick my schedule. And it meant that I was not technically in the corporate nine to five world. And then I got sucked in to the corporate nine to five world. The 401k match, the benefits, yada, 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 full time, vacation, 5 a.m. wake up call, all the things. Now I was still in the studio position, so I was still live in the studio. But after a couple months, I became very unhappy very quickly. And I did talk about this in my interview on the digital coffee date with Jessica Rosado, but essentially to give you just the most visual representation of what had happened, they had this mile long walking track at HSN and it was beautiful. It was around campus. And I mean, HSN, it's, it's a huge campus. There's tons of buildings and all the things. So they had a whole mile walking track and it was really nice. It was in nature. 
And I found myself doing that walk once, twice, sometimes three times a day. And it became so unbearable. The fact that I was walking in circles it with my time and with what felt like my career, it just felt like I was walking in circles. I just day in and day out, I would go, I would clock in, I would do the shift and I would just walk in circles and circles and circles. And I know some people are able to build their business before leaving their nine to five. And I have the utmost respect. If you're doing that right now, seriously commend yourself for what you are able to do. And the fact that you're able to do both, I was not able to do both. I felt like the job that I had was taking away all of the creative freedom, all of the energy, all of the time that I had, and I had nothing left to be able to give to building a business. And I mean, I was starting from square zero. I had absolutely no inkling of an idea what sort of business I was going to build. I was just walking in circles day in and day out, knowing, first of all, I am way too young for this (laughs) to be feeling this drained at a job. And second of all, something has to change. I don't know what, but something's got to change. I've had zero creative energy in years. I've got to create something. I have to do something. At the same time, I was still continuing to do the spokesperson work, which I loved, but I would only come when they called me. When they needed me, I would come. If they didn't need me, I wouldn't go. So I would, during set hours at HSN, I would see the guests and the hosts and everyone presenting on camera. And I would like feel this pull of, okay, that I could do that. I may love because I still love the spokesperson on camera work. I bet I could be amazing at that because of a million and one different rules that they had with corporate America policy. And what do they call it? Conflict of interest. I was not able to officially audition unless I left my job for a year. So there was 0% chance of me being able to transition onto the other side of the camera while I was still in this nine to five endless loop mile long walk that just went on repeat. So I had to leave. I quit. And when I quit, I think I had just come up with the name camera brave. So I left in February of 2021. And I think I came up with the name camera brave in late January. And I decided that I knew two things as to where I was in life. I knew two things. I knew how to take video. I knew a lot about video. I studied behind the scenes. I wouldn't call myself like a cinema, a cinematographer cinematic videographer. That's the, that's the words my brain was thinking, but my tongue was not going with it. I would not consider myself a cinematic videographer, but I know how to take a good video. I know the components that you need. I know how to make your framing look good. I know how to make you look good. That's what they taught us in school, that we were in the business of making people look good. I knew, I knew that I knew how to take video and I was comfortable on camera. I didn't claim that I was confident on camera. That just wasn't a word that I associated with myself. But if someone went, okay, tell me how to blank. I could talk to them because I'd had years of experience in presenting on camera. So those two things, I knew how to take video and I was comfortable on camera. I decided that was enough to create a business on. So I came up with Camera Brave. That's a whole nother story. I don't know if you guys have any interest in hearing how I came up with the name Camera Brave, but it's not what you think at all. And that was what I set out to do. I set out to get my mission statement right because I needed to make sure that I was attracting the right audience. So I came up with, and this is still my mission statement a year later, teaching entrepreneurs how to take stunning videos and feel confident on camera. That's where we're at. And that's almost exactly where it started. Now I have built out coaching programs. I have a monthly group. I have a six week course. I have a podcast. So I've built out a lot of different facets of this business, but that was essentially how it started with a name and a sentence. And I was off. So through this journey, I have really learned a lot. I think I have 
become a much better speaker because of this podcast. So if you're wondering, will being a podcast host make me a better speaker? It absolutely will, no matter where you are starting from. Getting this skill down every single week and speaking in this manner will 100% improve your linguistics. Does that mean I never mess up on words? <laughs> uh, play back to when I said, when I was trying to say cinematic videographer. Does that mean that I always have ideas endlessly? Nope. I look for ideas based on inspiration. I am an inspired storyteller. So I work best when there's an actual need for me to talk and when I'm actually able to present value. That's why this episode was a little difficult for me, but I felt it in my bones that it was time to talk about my story. So what are some takeaways for you? First of all, I am not a natural. If you see me on camera and you think she's a natural, thank you. But in reality, now you can see that I've been doing on-camera work for around a decade, like professional on-camera work for a decade. If you see my videos and think they look stunning, thank you so much. I got a four-year degree in broadcast production. My videos have to look stunning because if you saw my peers and the people I went to school with and the content that they're creating, whew, my stuff better look good and clean because I was trained for it to look good. So I hope that this inspires you and that you understand that comparison is the thief of everything. That looking at someone else's content, you have no idea their journey and the progress that they've made to get to the exact point in time that you were looking at today. So understand that. I have a whole lifelong love of storytelling. I have a passion for it. And I have only achieve just the tiniest little level, like micro level of storytelling that I, that I know that I will achieve. I have so many goals for myself. I have so much that I want to grow into that. If you're looking at me and thinking, oh, she's, she's got it. No, I'm still working for it. I do not have it yet. I've got this and this is amazing and it's beautiful, but there's a next level. There's 20 next levels for me, just like there may be for you. So what's a good takeaway from you? When's the last time you shared your story? It took me 43 episodes to share my story with you. Don't let it take you that long. Don't let it take you 43 weeks until you decide that it's time to tell your story. Tell your story to your audience. If you listen to this point, if you got here where I left in the rambling and the mumbo jumbo words, then that is proof that stories matter and that there is a power in telling your story. Not the LinkedIn professional blazer version of your story, but the real, you know what? This is how I got here and I'm not done yet. Still going. I still have so much more to do ahead of me. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode. I hope that you enjoyed hearing my story. I guess I'll know when I see the download numbers if you guys enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, would you please leave this show a review and share your story with someone because your story is worth telling. Even if you feel like you're a resty storyteller, even if it's difficult to kind of remember everything, just stick with the vision. I knew that telling you guys my story made sense if I told you my story as it relates to production, storytelling, and how I am in the process of becoming camera brave. So find your direction, tell your story, and share it with your audience. I guarantee you that they are going to value it. Thank you so much for listening in with me today, friends. As always, you can find me over at Camera Brave on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. I hope you have an amazing rest of your week and I will see you next time on the Camera Brave Show.